I got to keep track of them. Um, seeing we're sharing one hour, I, I want to really keep track of time. Because at the very beginning, I, as I was preparing some important notes, like speaking notes, I said, oh my God, what am I going to talk about for an hour? And um, now I have to um, cut that down, so I hope that I, I'm not going to overspeak. Overspeak. But um, somebody obviously will, uh, will keep track of time. Yes, it's me. Okay. okay. That's sort of the answer is in. So do you want me to give you a heads up five minutes? Yes. Five minutes? Okay. All right. Do you have 20 minutes to speak? Okay. So I've got 20 minutes to speak, and that probably includes questions, right? No, the question is afterwards. All right. Okay. So, well, uh, first of all, I, I need to um, always do the right thing. Which uh, is the way that I was taught in my culture, and uh, so basically what I'm going to say is, uh, unsurrendered Algonquin land. The city of Ottawa is on unsurrendered Algonquin land, the land that's been the ancestral, one of the ancestral territories of my people since time immemorial. I know some people may not like to hear it, but too bad to say, you're going to hear it. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak here. And I think it's really, really important, the theme here relating to First Nations people you're looking at media in a context of democracy, where is the place of First Nations people in the, the democracy of First Nations people in the media? Well, I themed uh, my presentation Friend or Foe, and what you will hear is from a First Nation perspective and experience. I'm going to share with you what I think media and democracy means in the themes or in a terms of, of Aboriginal voice. And I apologize that I have to reflect two notes. I usually try to speak from the heart, but um, in my old age and in my menopausal moments, I have to reflect two notes. <laughs> so I have to do this every now and then. So I'm going to present my topic from a First Nations point, not an Aboriginal. For Aboriginal is a policy term used by government and society, which includes First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. It's a pan approach, this pan Aboriginal approach. We are not the same people at all, absolutely not. Our histories are very different. The way government has treated with us or negotiated with us is very different. First Nations people are not Métis. Métis are not First Nations people. Inuit are not Métis. Inuit are not First Nations. We are very different. That is one fundamental, important lesson that the world needs to know. Even amongst First Nations people, there is diversity. There 
For 633 First Nations, we are different. So the term Aboriginal, again, is pan it's a pan approach. It doesn't work for us. And again, it's a government, the terminology Aboriginal is a government definition. It was defined by government. We are not Aboriginal. I am a Nishinaabe Algonquin woman. So you will hear my knowledge, my understandings, my voice, my presentation from an Anishinaabe First Nation perspective. And I thank you for allowing me to express my voice and as well for my words to be heard. So is media a friend or foe to First Nations? Well, that depends on who is the subject and who is the audience. If First Nations are the subject and society the audience, then media is the foe of First Nations and a friend of the government or society. How are First Nations voices represented in the media? Well, never mind about our voices. It's really about the people. When in fact, First Nations people are generally negatively represented by the media. And in my experience as a First Nations person, media can also be responsible for fueling racism against First Nations. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Malcolm X. This is so pertinent. It's so true and it's so applied to First Nations reality and experiences with media. And how in general Canadians believe and feel about Indian people. Because whether you believe it or not, racism is alive and well in this bountiful country called Canada. The land of freedom and equality. The land of peace and big brotherhood. Canada's image in the international world is one of peace freedom and equality and brotherhood, but for whom? Canada is so quick to dole out billions of dollars in foreign aid, but it neglects its own. And it certainly ensures that Indian people, First Nations, are not even on the bus or are not even on a boat pole. We've certainly been neglected, certainly been erased, certainly have been marginalized. And again, speaking from a First Nations perspective, not, there have been many different methods and processes that have been used and how they'll continue to marginalize and depress First Nations people, and media is one of them. And we certainly do not see the equal representation of First Nations people in media in the way that we are portrayed, or even the fact of having our, our own independent, controlled First Nations media sources. Well, let me take you back to how media can have society blaming the people who are being oppressed and sympathizing with the oppressor. The most recent was Elsie Bukto. When the First Nations Mi'kmaq people rose against the fracking to defend the land, to defend the water, not just for their people, but also for all Canadians, to protect the water, they stood against the fracking that was going on in her traditional territory. And we have seen how the media has portrayed the House of of Mi'kmaq people. They were the violators. They created a disruption. And by the way, they burned police cars. Never mind about the water that was being destroyed. Never mind about protecting the land for today and tomorrow. What was what was more important was showing how violent these Indians were and how they were burning a police car. But the media neglected to show the beating of the women and the old people that stood there in the human chain to protect the land. Another example I want to share with you was American Indian Movement in the 
1970s when our people rose up against the killings and the oppressions and the racism. But the media portrayed the American Indian movement as terrorists. But back then, in their word, wasn't, was, uh, terrorists was accused. It was communism. They attached American Indian movement people with communism because if you remember, back then communism was such a great fear, right? So they destroyed American Indian movement through the media. And I'm not to say I was part of the American Indian movement, even though I may have been a little too young, but nevertheless, I'm proud to say I was. Even though I wanted to be a wounded knee, 1972, my grandfather, uh, the late William Commander, would not allow me because I was too young. And then he said to me, don't worry, you're going to grow older, and when you're older, you're going to have a chance to be there. I grew older, but everybody became passive, so I never got a chance to be there. But I was still involved with the American Indian Movement that continued on. As a matter of fact, I was part of the Native People's Caravan that came up to uh, Parliament Hill in 19. When hundreds of thousands of Native Americans from across the United States and Canada would gather to stop the oppression, to raise the, the awareness of what was going on with our people, the killing, the police brutality, the racism, the lack of adequate housing, the disp dispossession of our lands, and on and on and on. <coughs> but of course, waiting for us was the police and the riot squad. The most recent, again, I want to, another example is Idle No More. Idle No More, such a, a great grassroots movement that brought the people together in unity. But it was portrayed negatively. That it was creating discourse, especially with government implementation of what, Bill C-38 and Bill C-45, right? You shouldn't have these Idle No More people. And what was portrayed about them? What are these people doing at, at the expense of the taxpayer? They should be working. Instead, they're gathering people to unite. But I don't know more. It wasn't just about First Nations. It was about Canadians. It was, again, about protecting the land, protecting the water, protecting the environment. Because we all know C-38 and uh, C-45 was taking away the protections of the environment. And another uh, prime example, which I always tell the students, and I am, it's nice to see one of my students here as well, is the $10 billion myth. Our media likes to keep on talking about this $10 billion, and it's a myth. How $10 billion of taxpayers' money is always going towards Indians. Well, that is a myth, and it's a downright because if $10 billion indeed did go into First Nations communities, we'd be the richest of the riches in our own homeland. We wouldn't be the poorest of the poor in our own lands. Because this $10 billion, it goes to support the 95 different federal programs with all its employees that continue to make decisions for First Nations people that live on reserves. The Department of Indian Affairs, one of, the, one of the biggest federal departments in addition to Health Canada, with its many, many thousands of employees, who by the way, are, many of them are not First Nations, this $10 billion goes towards that entity. It continues to perpetuate colonialism, oppression, marginalization, and dependency of First Nations people. For every dollar, 10 cents goes into a community. And by the way, it's not take taxpayers' money that goes into communities. Because in 1886, there was a trust that was created between the federal government and for First Nations, whereby the federal government entered into a trust. They signed a trust agreement whereby any monies that would be generated the land and the natural resources of First Nations lands, it would go into a trust fund that the federal government would hold in trust for First Nations to provide the funding for First Nations. So it's not taxpayers' money. The false information, the negative